So hello, everybody. I am Megan from Blue Ground. Um, we're so excited to uh, be having you all here with us virtually tonight. Uh, this is our first ever uh, global uh, Blue Ground community webinar, and we are so excited to be hosting all of you. And we're even more excited to have Dr. Yelena uh, Ketz Manovich joining us, uh, and I just absolutely butchered your name even though we've practiced it already, but Dr. K, as we so lovingly refer to her as, um, is a founder and director of Arlington DC Behavior Therapy Institute and an adjunct professor at Georgetown University in the psychology department. She's an expert in cognitive behavioral therapy with over 25 years of experience in psychotherapy, teaching, public speaking, and research. So we're really excited to have her today to go over some of the um, great uh, kind of tips and tools that she has for dealing with stress and anxiety and different emotions that we're feeling um, during this time while we're stuck in our homes. Um, um, a few things before I kind of turn it over to Dr. K. Um, there will be about a 40, 45 minute presentation and then we'll be thrilled to um, kind of go over some of your guys' questions as well. Um, if you can use the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen, you can submit your questions anonymously and we would be happy to uh, go over them at the close of the session. Um, and with that, I will go ahead and uh, turn it over to Dr. K. Megan, thank you so much uh, for introducing me so kindly, and I'm very happy to be with everybody here tonight, uh, all the Blue Ground uh, members. Um, so uh, I indeed uh, am a therapist, a clinical psychologist here in the Washington DC area. Uh, my uh, primary job is clinical work these days, and I also supervise uh, many associates in our practice. We have a about 10 members right now in our group CBT practice uh, just outside our uh, DC area in Arlington. And um, I also teach at Georgetown. Um, so, you know, I was been invited uh, here and, and have been invited to other places to uh, talk about coping with stress, anxiety, and all kinds of other emotions that are showing up for all of us right now. So uh, the plan is to you know, go over a little bit about what are these emotions that are showing up. Is that normal? Uh, should we be worried about it? And uh, what can we do short term and long term to uh, cope uh, and process with and cope and process these emotions better um, so that we can uh, increase our psychological resilience and do on a daily basis what we need to do, behave in a ways that uh, we it's, are consistent with how we want to be as people. So without further ado, let's go to the slides. I have a few slides just to help us orient, um, you know, to what we're talking about. And so first of all, I would like to emphasize and even overemphasize um, this idea that what we're feeling, which might be fear, anxiety, grief, sadness, loneliness, anger, irritability, loss of pleasure, frustration, any of these, name it, negative emotions, um, that are being felt by a lot of people, if not most people, uh, in the current circumstances. Um, these are very, very much normal natural responses to the stressors that we're facing. Uh, main aspects of the current situation that are psychologically taxing are, I would say, maybe number one is danger that we are all facing and dealing with. And it's this kind of ambiguous um, uh, danger that's lurking out there. Not, you know, it's concrete, but it's also uh, hidden, uh, you know, it's tr not being able to be seen. Uh, and that is very hard. Dealing with um, danger in general, of course, evokes a lot of uh, a sense of threat and a lot of fear reactions and anxiety reactions that can go from, you know, feeling just a little bit uneasy and a little nervous to full blown panic or full blown what we call panic attack. Um, when we feel anxious, we have a lot of worried, anxious thoughts. We go down the what if rabbit holes that I'm sure are familiar to all of us. We end up 
often catastrophizing and you know uh, worrying about all possible negative outcomes that might come uh, in the future we also uh, feel in our bodies a uh, lot of different physical sensations which are intricately uh, kind of tied with this anxious response. We might be feeling, uh, you know, stomach distress or all kinds of different GI distress. We feel uh, shortness of breath possibly. We feel um, heart rate racing, you know, heart rate going up, heart racing. We might feel dryness in our throats. We ha can have headache. We can have uh, muscle tension. Um, you know, and a bunch of other uh, kind of physical responses. And, and it's, it, it's interesting, you know, a lot of people are talking about feeling, feeling really tired and feeling really physically tense and exhausted and, um, you know, and headachey and just like feeling this malaise. It's almost like my physical malaise has come over them. And, you know, uh, it's not often that we relate that to actually psychological situation that uh, we're finding ourselves in. It turns out that a lot of psychological um, responses like anxiety, like depression, have these physical um, parts as well. And uh, so it's, it's also, you know, important to remember that feelings, you know, consist of things that happen in our mind, in our brain, is kind of how we think about emotions, but also how we feel emotion in our bodies. And that, it'll, you know, that idea uh, of emotions being both mind and body reactions is going to come handy later on when we talk about what to do about these emotions. Um, so danger is there, you know, our natural threat responses are being activated. We're also dealing with incredible um, isolation. We are social species, that's very hard for us. For a lot of people, this brings about a lot of sadness, a lot of grief. Uh, we're dealing with losses, anywhere from loss of life, of course, to loss of all the small and medium sized things that normally make up our lives. Um, socializing, going to restaurants, right? Exercising in gyms, being part of different clubs and groups and going to school, participating in our workplace and so forth. There are a lot of losses, the accumulated losses that we're dealing with. And, and we know, um, as I'm sure most of you can relate to, that losses lead to sadness, they lead to grief. Um, and there is no way to jump over that in a way. Um, those, those emotions are natural and should be seen primarily as very natural human evolutionary conditioned responses to what's happening to us. Finally, we're dealing with uncertainty, unprecedented uncertainty. Um, this is again a quality of a current situation um, that's uh, extremely hard to deal with. There are some fascinating psychological experiments actually that show that um, people uh, can adjust better even to negative outcomes compared to uncertain outcomes. Um, one study comes to mind with, that showed that they did the genetic testing with a group of people and turns out that test is not uh, extremely precise. So they, it either tells you you will get this disorder or not, or we don't know. And um, right after the participants in the study got the results, you can imagine the people who found out they won't get the disorder were very happy, happier than usual, and the other two groups felt quite bad and their psychological um, functioning was lower than usual. Well, um, that's as predicted, right, as we would all predict. However, when measured three months later, and then especially when measured six months later, they kind of follow up with those participants and very interestingly found that people who found out they won't get a disorder, they were still doing very well, kind of came back to the equilibrium of well-being and happiness. But the group that found out that they will get disorder also came back to the equilibrium. Uh, you know, they came back to kind of their regular, you know, psychological functioning. It was the group that was in the uncertain category, the uh, group that didn't know that was really still suffering and had some anxiety and depression and so forth. So this is just to illustrate that anxiety um, is really hard thing for us humans to deal with. But, you know, if we will talk about what are some ways in which we can at least um, help ourselves deal with it um, and help, um, you know, make, make sense of the current situation. So um, in terms of dealing uh, with myriad of emotions that are showing up, uh, I've divided them in two categories. Um, th there are many ways to divide these strategies and these tips, but I divided them for, the, for our purposes tonight into two categories. One is more short-term 
first a kind of psychological band-aid, um, you know, uh, uh, solutions that we can apply quickly when we feel particularly overwhelmed by negative emotions. So in, in cases when we start to panic, when we start to cat catastrophize, when we start to, you know, spin uh, sort of quote unquote out of control, when we uh, find ourselves getting really angry and irritable, irrationally perhaps, um, or we are getting really sad, starting to cry and just, you know, uncontrollably kind of go down in that, that really dark place. Um, so, you know, these strategies are really helpful in the moment to help us kind of get over that bump uh, onto the other side. And then we will learn about what, you know, what strategies are kind of more effective in terms of long-term coping with these kind of negative emotions. I want to emphasize that these first day strategies are uh, particularly useful when you know you are finding yourself in a situation where you your emotions are getting the best of you and you are unable to react to whatever the situation demands in the best way so i will illustrate that you know if you're finding yourself um struggling with terrible anxiety and, and, you know, kind of panicking about not having finished something for work and your child needs you to show her something for her school. A lot of us are, you know, really doing double duty or triple duty, um, trying to be basically teach home teachers of our kids at home, as well as trying to do work from home, which is extremely hard and very stressful for majority of people. Um, so your child needs you and, and you, you sort of need to be there in the moment, present, focused on their needs and, you know, function the best you can as a parent. And the panic, the extreme anxiety is taking you away from being effective in that moment. These are the kind of situations that I recommend using these, you know, first aid strategies or you're finding that uh, you're fighting more with your spouse, uh, tensions are running high because we are all cooped up together. Again, this is very unique situation in our modern life where you know, we are together with our um, partners or, or spouses all the time uh, you know, in each other's space. And it's not easy, it's not easy. And uh, you know, we will feel uh, irritable more often than not, and we will feel angry. And sometimes, again, the anger bubbles up in us and we are unable to react with kindness. We are unable to behave as a partner that we would like to be. And we can recognize, notice that this is coming up in us and remove ourselves for, from the situation just for a second, take time out, as I call it, and use some of these strategies to just de-escalate emotional arousal and we are, when we are in a better emotional place, come back to the conversation. Um, so again, the, the, uh, these strategies can be used either in the moment itself, or sometimes you might need to remove yourself and go to a you know, different room, even to a bathroom, you know, and, um, and do, do this, implement these. So, so what are the, some of the strategies? Um, my favorite one to start with always, and I, I definitely use this one, uh, is called grounding with five senses. Um, grounding means, you know, we are trying to ground ourselves into the present moment and focus on the experience of five senses. One thing about sensing that uh, you can, I'm sure, relate to if you think about that is that we can only sense in the present. So if I'm asking you, what are you seeing right now? Or what are you touching right now? Or what are you hearing right now? That orients you to present moment. It kind of grounds you to here now, and it takes you away from the, the mind loops that tend to get us you know, in trouble um, and get, get, tend to get us into these very um, extreme emotional situations. Um, so uh, focusing, you know, just stopping whatever you're doing, just for, for a couple of seconds, stopping whatever you're doing and very mindfully focusing on the experience of five senses. It can be done in different ways. I like this um, little approach where I ask myself, what are the five things I'm seeing? I'm just going to stop for a second, describe what are the five things I'm seeing. I'm seeing my lamp, I'm seeing my water here. Uh, 
I see birds outside uh, on the tree and so forth. So describe five things. Four things that you're hearing. So hearing is a very interesting one because you can think about layers of sound, right? The first thing that I might be hearing is noise in the next room. Uh, my son play, playing video games and then a little further I hear the birds again and a little further even maybe some cars in the background and so forth. So, you, you know, seeing and hearing are, are most acute and most developed senses in humans. So it's nice to start with that. Then a third one would be um, to touch three things. Wherever you find yourself standing, sitting, laying down, just touch three things and describe the, the texture, the temperature, how they feel under your hands. Um, the fourth one would be smell. Describe two things that you can smell. If you, know, you really can't smell anything, you're not outside and so forth, you know, make yourself a cup of coffee or uh, pour yourself a, a drink and you can describe them to uh, two smells that you're feeling and finally taste. Of course, you have to put something in your mouth to feel that. And it's a, it's a very simple and yet powerful strategy. Um, similar to that is the idea of getting physical. Again, the idea is that we are actually getting into our bodies because that is where a lot of this emotional tension is being felt. And so instead of focusing on sensing, what we're doing here is um, moving our bodies and if possible, moving them in a kind of extreme way. So for um, anger and anxiety, which are arousing emotions, there is a pent up energy in a way in us. And what's really helpful is to do five or 10 minutes of really intense cardio exercise, whatever that is. I love stairs. I think that's one of the best ones. If you have access to stairs, just going up and down, up and down, up and down the stairs as fast as you can. Of course, uh, being aware of your physical limitations. We don't wanna you know, overdo it and, and hurt yourself. Um, but, you know, if you don't have stairs, it can be, you know, running in place, jogging in place or jogging outside if you have access to that. Um, for, for anger and anxiety, it's not that hard to motivate ourselves to do it. Uh, and it tends to really help with um, attenuating that, that arousal that we feel in these two uh, kinds of emotions. When it comes to sadness, depression, which are, uh, you know, more... Um, opposite emotion to of arousal, that it's under arousal, right? Uh, when it comes to that, it's harder to motivate ourselves to move, but if we can manage to motivate ourselves, uh, sometimes with the help of our near and dear ones, um, it actually helps also tremendously. We know that moving your body, which is opposite from what we usually want to do when we feel depressed and kind of sad and we want to, you know, curl in the ball and put our covers on top of us, right? Uh, and yet, moving, getting out of the house, moving, you know, if you can even exercise and raise your heart rate even better, um, tends to really lift the mood, helps with mood. Um, third strategy here that I'll talk about is something that colloquially we call it belly breathing. Um, in, um, in, in our literature, we call it diaphragmatic breathing. And it's, um, it's a nice strategy that actually has been experimentally studied uh, all the way goes back to 60s. Um, so what you do here is the idea is to breathe out of your belly, out of your stomach in a way. How do you do that? You put one hand on your chest and one hand on your stomach and you try to breathe the best you can in such a way that your stomach hand moves as much as possible and that your chest hand stays still as much as possible. This will not be perfect. You know, let's not shoot for perfection. There's no such thing as perfection. But the idea is that, you know, the best you can, you kind of uh, stay with your breath as you breathe in and the breath goes down and metaphorically, almost like imagine that air is going all the way down and that you're feeling a balloon in your stomach and your stomach goes way, 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 way out and then way, 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 way down on each exhale and way, 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 way out and way down in e on each exhale. But your belly, your stomach, not your chest. We're keeping the chest still. If you're having a hard time figuring how to actually do this, and it's, it's good doing either, um, it's actually best if you start doing this laying down. To really learn this technique, laying down is the best way to start. And then later on, you can also do it sitting down. Um, and when you lay down, to really uh, feel that you're doing it right, you can put some books on your stomach and kind of watch the books go up and down, up and down. 
So it's, um, it's a relaxation technique. It's actually a, a technique that literally slows down your sympathetic arousal. So it, it you know, in, in you know, biological terms, it actually de-escalates the sympathetic uh, system arousal and it, it leads to what's called parasympathetic dominance, which is when we relax. And uh, experimental studies have shown us that actually around seven minutes on, on average, for an average person, it takes several minutes. So this is not instantaneous. That's important to remember. It's not instantaneous, but it's still darn quick. You know, seven minutes is, is not such a long time. Um, it takes seven minutes to actually de-escalate this arousal. So if you're feeling really worked up, angry, anxious, this is a very good technique to calm down. Uh, so you can time it on your on your um, uh, cl clock. These days, it's, it's it's really our phones, right? That we time ourselves on every seven minutes. Sometimes when you become good at it, you can even do it. You know, it can happen quicker because then it becomes a learned response. Um, th there's one trick that I actually learned. Uh, you know, just when you think that that you've you know been uh, practicing and teaching um, this uh, diaphragmatic breathing for for decades, really at this point, um, somebody showed me a trick a couple of years ago that if if you're having really hard time again, just really getting into this, that a good way to start is actually to put your hands like this and push your elbows way back. And then you can feel how you have to move your stomach to breathe because your chest is immobilized. So that's a nice way to start this as well. So another trick. So beyond that, what else can we do? When, when I call um, uh, distraction, positive distraction, what do I mean by positive distraction? Um, you know, we all use distraction to distract ourselves, hopefully just temporarily from sometimes overwhelming negative feelings. And, you know, there's time and place for that. There's time and place for Netflix binging and video games and um, scrolling down the internet and so forth, although we should be very careful about not um, over utilize, over, uh, you know, uh, uh, being overexposed to the news because that actually has been shown now scientifically to lead to uh, more psychological distress. So we should be very moderate to how, how much we're exposing ourselves to news, uh, whether it's online or TV or social media. Um, so, you know, some social media, you know, some, um, you know, some cocktail in the evening, um, in video games, some, you know, movies can be from time to time a useful distraction. Beyond that, um, there are some methods that, there are a few methods that are actually quite helpful in very quickly and effectively distracting ourselves from this worried, you know, ruminating mind that gets us in trouble. So um, one that I love, that's kind of silly uh, technique, but I love and I, it works really well, is if you sort of feel that you're starting to catastrophize, you're getting yourself worked up, you're in this rabbit hole, what ifs, what ifs, um, you go and get the bucket filled with cold water and then you pour bunch of, you put a bunch of ice from your freezer in that cold water. So now it's icy water, really cold water. And you immerse your hands in it above the elbows and you keep your hands as long as possible there. And again, as I said, it's a little silly technique, but actually it works really well. It's, it becomes very painful to keep your hands there. But what happens is you, you end up really focusing on that part of your body and really getting out of your mind and into your body, which tends to be quite helpful when it comes to emotions. Um, then another uh, relaxation technique, uh, it's officially a relaxation technique that we also use in CBT. By the way, a lot of these techniques derive from cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. I practice. Um, it's called progressive muscle relaxation, a PMR. Um, and again, very simple, effective technique whereupon you go from your toes all the way up, 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 up to the top of your head. And then you, in sequence, tense your muscles and then release your muscles. Tense your muscles and release your muscles. And so we might start, for example, from toes of your right foot and we might tense over five seconds. One, two, three, four, five. Keep the tension. Feel how those toes are feeling right now. Are they tingling? Do you feel that sensation? What, are they warm? What's happening in your toes? And then we relax over five. One, two, three, four, five. 
notice if there's any tension left. Usually there is. How they're feeling right now, your toes. And then we're gonna do five more relaxation. One, two, three, four, five. And your toes are relaxed. And then you go for your whole right foot and then you go left toes and left foot and so on and so on. And this exercise can be done um, in a relatively short period of time, over five or 10 minutes. And it can be as long as 40 minutes. There, are, if you look on the internet on YouTube, there are some uh, protocols for progressive muscle relaxa relaxation that last full 40 minutes. Um, the longer you do it, it tends to be more effective. But uh, with practice, one can become, again, very good at uh, tensing and relaxing pretty big groups of muscles. So it doesn't have to take that long. And again, very powerful technique. Something that applies here that's worth noting is that um, there's a saying in my field in psychology that has been actually scientifically proven to be true. And that is that you cannot feel anxious in a relaxed body. So just think for, you know, about that for a second. We, none of us, can feel anxious in a relaxed body. So if body relaxes, you relax, you feel relaxed. So interesting thing to try. And finally, visualizing safe space is a technique that um, I think a lot of us have tried, you know, even without maybe knowing that it's, you know, has official name in psychology, we like to make up terms in psychology. And visualizing safe place means, um, you know, remembering a place, you know, typically can be in the mountains, on the beach, uh, your wedding day, although that ends up being stressful for a lot of people, um, whatever a specific time and place was where you felt really content, good, relaxed, safe, secure. And, you know, think about that, what, what that is. And, and it's good to have one, one image that you can always come back to. And then go into that scene as if you were entering a movie and really describe for yourself, what are you smelling? What are you hearing? What it's around you? Who are you talking to? How the dialogue goes? Um, what are you feeling in that moment? So, you know, really sort of imagine yourself in that movie. And it tends to be, again, very powerful technique. It's, it's incredible what our minds can conjure. So those are the first day techniques. And now we're gonna talk about, a little bit about longer term uh, technique strategies. Um, these are strategies that uh, are you know to sort of be implemented over a period of time and it, these are more kind of general approaches to emotions that help us productively feel the emotions process them not get stuck in the overdrive with the emotions make sense of the emotions have emotions not um, dictate how we live our lives um, and not be kind of hostages of emotions um, so the sort of overarching principle here that very much again aligns with CBT and in more, even more particular with a subtype of CBT called ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy, which is really my kind of home base when it comes to my psychotherapeutic approach, is the idea, so this main principle, the idea is that we, um, generally speaking, in life could will do better and will generally be much more psychologically uh, sound and, and find ourselves generally in a, a better state of well-being if we learn to make space for, make room for difficult negative feelings and emotions and physical sensations and thoughts. So the idea here is to uh, become aware uh, when we are habitually avoiding running away from, distracting ourselves from, fighting, trying to control, trying to escape negative thoughts, negative feelings, negative sensations. So while again, as I mentioned before, doing it here and there, and there are times when we need to do that again to get through the day, that's fine. This is not absolutist. You know, that there's again, that nothing in psychology is, is, uh, is you know, all or nothing. The idea is that if we do again and again and again, constantly and habitually react 
too emotional experience by trying to run away from it, um, we get ourselves in trouble. Why? Because what you resist persists. Again, another saying in psychology, and this we credit to Carl Jung, a Swiss psych psych psychiatrist who practiced uh, more than 100 years ago. And, and you know, we, we credit this to him. We're not sure if he's the one who first said this. But what did he mean by what you resist persists? He meant exactly this, that the more you try to push away these uncomfortable sensations that you just don't want to have, you just don't want to, you know, it's yucky, you don't want to feel that way. They do go away for a while. They, you know, you, 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 you can run away from them for a while, but they come back an hour later, a day later with a, with a vengeance. And this is how we end up with psychological problems. We, this is, for example, uh, a, a way that we, for, you know, science shows us is a way that, for example, anxiety is maintained and that we end up with severe anxiety and anxiety disorders like generalized anxiety disorder, GAD, or panic disorder, or OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, or different phobias, or social phobia, or agoraphobia, you know, what, whatever it might be. Um, so, so it's a it's it's an interesting you know thing to think about is that you know that uh, while avoidance here and there is fine, this you know habitual um, approach to emotions uh, with with the stance of like I can't have that right is uh, is really counterproductive. It's like a boomerang that you know you 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 push it away, it comes back with a vengeance. So um, how do we do that in a big picture? You know, how do we uh, slowly learn to allow these emotions, to notice them, to verbalize them, to label them, um, and to accept them as whatever they are and have them wash over you without pushing them away or indulging them? So one of the main methods that we use is mindfulness, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard about because it's, of course, it has been a buzzword, not only in the therapeutic community, also in corporate America and so forth. Um, and, you know, a lot has been made of mindfulness. And uh, I think that, you know, mindfulness, uh, we need to get sort of back at the very basic principle of mindfulness, which is incredibly simple. Mindfulness is no more, no less, it is a way of paying attention deliberately, intentionally to something, whatever it is that you decide you wanna pay attention to. It can be these slides here in front of you on a computer, it can be your breathing, it can be your thoughts, whatever you're trying to, wanting to focus on, pay attention to in the present moment. So it's focusing onto something in the present moment while being aware that your mind will take you away from that focus because that's what our minds do. Our minds are very hyperactive, right? And not just if we have ADD, all of our minds are hyperactive. And the minds will go into the past, into the future, into here, into here, into here. And the idea of mindfulness is noticing when mind has taken you away from whatever you're trying to focus on, catch your mind, metaphorically speaking, right? And bring it back to your point of focus. That's it. That's all it is. And it goes away and catch it and bring it back to the point of focus. And then you're focusing it, ah, it's going away again. Catch it, bring it back to the point of focus. That's all it is. That's so-called mindful process. That's, that's practicing mindfulness. And it can be done, facilitated by recordings. There are plenty of them, uh, Headspace and Karma, two apps that, that I like, uh, that they're probably hundreds of apps these days, um, and a lot of web recordings, uh, a lot of YouTube recordings. Most of them are, are free and very accessible. Um, these uh, two apps, I think, have actually basic levels for free now during the coronavirus crisis. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's helpful to start with recordings. The idea being, though, that you will internalize this and that, you know, over time, uh, you know, while doing it in a, in a more structured, formal fashion, like doing four times a day, 10 minutes of mind, recorded mindfulness, you listen to the recordings and you do what they say, that eventually this be becomes part of how you live your life, not not being um, unrealistic and expecting that we're going to be mindful, fully mindful every moment of our life, far from that. But it turns out that 
And research shows us this. It's very fascinating that even if we increase mindfulness, natural mindfulness in our daily waking life, a little bit, just a little bit, if we increase how we approach life, we approach it more mindfully, that it actually has pretty significant effects on well-being, on sleeping, on ability to focus, on depression, on anxiety, and so forth. So, um, you know, it's a good example of how, um, you know, a lot of psychological techniques and strategies that we use, um, you know, m might seem like they make a little bit of a change in how you function or approach the world or behave in certain situations. And yet those small changes can actually result in pretty big gains. Um, so besides mindfulness, uh, there are other strategies that uh, can be also applied mindfully, but that we, uh, you know, work with, for example, our clients uh, with, and it can be done in general. One is actually to, lear uh, to learn to better differentiate emotions. So again, seems a little silly, like really, like the increasing my vocabulary for emotions can help me. Turns out, yes, there's a pretty substantial amount of research that shows that you know going um, on a web on a web and finding what's called emotional wheel which is this handy little thing which you know shows you like good let's say you're feeling good or bad and then bad separates into sad and angry and anxious and irritable and so forth so you can ask yourself okay so am i feeling good or bad bad okay so of the bad options where am i really ah uh, okay i'm i guess i'm irritable okay then irritable separates into further categories and so on and so on and so you you're kind of learning to broaden your emotional vocabulary but it's not just broadening voc vocabulary you're kind of uh, learning to notice in your body in your mind what are these emotions what I'm, that I'm feeling and how I'm going to label those. And it turns out that really being able to differentiate and label can increase in, you know, in a big picture, the, you know, increase your uh, psychological resilience and ability to process emotions more successfully. Expressing your emotions constructively with people who you trust, who are trustworthy, who are gonna be validating, who are, are not gonna be invalidating um, is a no brainer, of course, for all of us. And, it, and it's really, again, we have to be careful that when I say constructively, it, it, it does mean, you know, uh, expressing your emotions to, to people who will be helpful for you because we, you know, there are, there are situations where we express emotions and we kind of get punished for it. And, and it's quite obvious, it goes without saying that that's not a good context whereupon you should be expressing your emotions. Therapeutic writing is writing about your emotions. We actually have um, a, a protocol for this that has been, again, research uh, for decades. Um, it's called Pennebaker Writing Protocol. And what it does is it actually instructs you for 20 minutes to sit down, you can do it tonight, to write about something emotional in your life. You don't have to show it to anybody. You don't have to read it ever again. The whole point is to just write without stopping for 20 minutes without worrying about, you know, whether it sounds good, whether your grammar is good and so forth and your style. And then you close the computer, whatever you're writing, you can be handwritten, of course, not written typed on a computer. And then you do the same thing next day and the same thing next day for three consecutive days. And that's it. And, you know, you can come back and read it later or years later if you want, but no need to. You can deleted from your computer, that the process of actually putting these emotions to paper three consecutive days have been shown to be really therapeutic and helpful. And finally, increasing self-compassion. That goes back um, all, to, uh, all the way to the beginning of our presentation when I talked about, you know, approaching these emotional experiences as normal, as understandable, as really something that is completely to be expected during the really stressful hard times we're finding ourselves in. You know, this, these are unprecedented times. For most of us, you know, this, this is harder than a lot of things we've gone through in, in our lives. And, it, and it's such a global <laughs> thing, right, that we're all facing. Um, you know, that, that lot on internet, you hear a lot of these memes, like, we're all in it together. And then uh, somebody posted on Twitter, I, I like this, that um, a teacher posted that said, you know, that this one kid, a third grade kid said, this is false. It, we are not in, in it 
together, we are all in it separately alone. So which of course makes it even harder, right? Uh, we are in it together, we're facing it the same thing, but we're doing it in isolation, which is extremely hard. So just bringing uh, this spirit of self-compassion and self-forgiveness and self-understanding to this experience. You know, we, we can be sometimes much more compassionate toward our children, uh, to, toward our friends, um, compared to how we are toward ourselves. You know, often we'll say, okay, just snap out of it. Why are you feeling this? What, what's wrong with you? Why, why, why are you getting, I mean, you should be better at this. Well, you should be able to, you know, work as productively as you always have been able to work and, and manage your kids. And, you know, this is just not good enough, right? Um, and so uh, it turns out that being judgmental and critical and saying it's not okay to feel badly you won't be surprised when I say this, is gonna make you feel even worse. And it's gonna make you feel even worse about yourself, which will then lead to more judgment and so on and so on. So, um, you know, it turns out that actually self-compassionate stand and, you know, giving yourself a break, basically. This is tough and you're gonna feel really crappy sometimes and it's okay. And you can be kind to yourself in this process. Actually, leads to better outcomes than the alternative. Sometimes, to to engender this, I will ask my clients to um, imagine treating themselves as a child or or friend. I say, how would you treat a child? Now, turn that toward yourself. So it's a little nice exercise. Okay. So um, finally, uh, well, two, two final points. Um, that the kinds of thinking patterns that can also exacerbate um, our emotions. And a couple that I just want to underline, um, they are, uh, you know, because they're very insidious and they really get us in trouble. It's kind of how we think about what's happening to us and how we think about events outside of us and how we think about our own emotional experience can either lead to better outcomes or worse outcomes. Worry and rumination, which are these recurrent repetitive patterns. Um, where we kind of spin, right? Spin in circles, worries, future focus, rumination is past focused. Um, you know, we ruminate about past mistakes or uh, regrets. We worry about what might be. Um, the catastrophizing at the bottom of the slide here uh, is typically what we do when we worry, right? We worry uh, when outcomes are uncertain, but what we end up doing is we end up filling all these uncertain holes so to say, an uncertain space with projected negative outcomes. So instead of accepting that this is uncertain and unknowable and kind of sitting with that uncertainty, what our mind does, because our mind so wants to go get to the point of certainty, right? We fill these gaps with negative outcomes and then we start to worry and obsess about them, right? And um, that, that's called catastrophizing. And as you can imagine, it makes us feel even worse about ourselves. And so, you know, this idea that we can kind of worry our way out of our, our emotional distress is just not true. And so first of all, we have to really examine our positive myths, as I call them, about worry and rumination. And next, really try the best we can to separate as soon as we start worrying to separate the matters that we have some control over. And then if we do, if we find something that we have some control over, like what are we gonna do for grocery shopping this week, even though grocery shopping is very frustrating and hard, and how we're gonna make plan to either go to grocery store or wake up in the middle of the night to order online or whatever, you know, we can make a plan. So that's called problem solving, right? So if we think about something that we can do something about, then we shift into problem solving and you do that. But everything else, everything else is something we cannot do anything about. And that falls into worry and that's completely unproductive. And so, you know, the best we can, we should shift our attention away from it. One strategy that I like for people who say, I just can't stop worrying. I know it's not effective and I know it's not useful, but I can't stop worrying. Um, there, there is actually, even for people who feel that way, and a lot of us do, um, you know, I, 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 again, a silly technique might sound to you, but it's, it's actually quite effective to say you have 20 minutes worry time. Decide that, you know, from 2 to 2.20 2 each day p.m. is your worry time. And, you know, when you start worrying any other time during the day, just write it down on a piece of paper or in your notebook, in your phone, and you say, okay, I have it. It's down here. I have those 20 minutes. I'm going to worry all that I can during that time. 
all that I you know can imagine worrying, and then I'm going to close the time you know and move on. And um, and so it it really it it actually shows you that you actually have control over worrying, so that you can you know at least the rest of your time is worry free or mostly worry free. Uh, we also need to be aware that perfectionism, perfectionistic stance that you know a lot of us can be uh, uh, guilty of, uh, fuels very much worry and rumination because if we, especially during these trying times when we need to be flexible in terms of changing the way how we do things, uh, changing our methods, changing our goals, um, you know, if if we get stuck into well, that's not perfect. That's not how I normally do it. That's not the best way to do it you know, then we start spinning. Then we start spinning in this worry cycle and we end up, you know, not only doing things imperfectly, but we end up procrastinating or not doing things. So getting paralyzed, which is of course much worse outcome. So really, you know, examining a perfectionism in, in this situation is, um, is, is an important thing. Uh, I talked about catastrophizing and all or nothing thinking is actually what I just mentioned. The idea that if it cannot be perfect, then, you know, we call it in psychology, we call it what the hell effect? If I, it cannot be perfect or exactly how I imagined, then, then I'm not gonna do anything. And of, as you can imagine, that's very unproductive kind of thinking at this point. Um, okay, oof, I'm, I'm running out of time. Okay, so I'm just gonna uh, quickly go through this and then take your questions. You know, the, uh, persist in your healthy routines or reinvent them. This is again, something that, that's not gonna be new to any of you because the, these kind of strategies have, you know, we've been bombarded by them through all the media and social media and so forth. And that is of course, taking care of the basics, pillars of well-being, as I call them. Good sleep, good nutrition, socializing as much as you can, even if it's virtual, if it's virtual finding some relaxing time, recreation, exercise, exercise, exercise. It doesn't have to be fancy. It just needs to get your heart, heart rate up. Cardio, some kind of cardio, even walking outside will do the trick. We know it is incredibly related to psychological well-being and emotional well-being. If you can get out outside, not everybody can do it. Do it at least for an hour a day. Daylight, you know, a light from the daylight. It doesn't have to be sunshine. Daylight actually physiologically affects our mood. We know, again, have a lot of evidence for this. So get out at least an hour outside if you can, even if you sit in, on your patio. And if you can go to nature, even better. And finally, um, something that you know I like to wrap up with, and that, that is this idea that this might be really, 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 really hard time, and it is for most of us. And it also might be, just might be a time when we have been forcefully slowed down a little bit. You know, a lot of external things in our lives have uh, ceased to, to exist for now, right? And so we have little more time to, to reflect upon our lives and maybe to evaluate and reevaluate our priorities and how we live our lives. And, you know, whether how, you know, things that we spend our time on, what we focus on really aligns with who we want to be as people. What do we want to stand for? That, you know, do our behaviors day to day during the normal life, do they align with our values, right? And this, you know, this time can help us connect to, you know, what are the sources of meaning in your life? What is the purpose? Do you find your purpose in your endeavors, in your work, in your creativity, in, in your, um, you know, some pursuit of whether hobby or work? Do you find it in relating to other people? Do you find it in your uh, connecting with God or nature in a spiritual way? You know, where, where do you draw that meaning? What, you know, what makes you wake up uh, you know, every day in life? Not necessarily what makes you happy. Um, you know, I, I joke that I'm Eastern European, so we think, you know, we, we in Eastern Europe think that happiness is overrated. Um, and a lot of my American clients uh, find that funny, but, you know, but just, you know, just take time. This is a unique opportunity to just step back because we've been kind of thrown out of that ev everyday life. Step back and kind of reflect on your life. And maybe there's a chance to, to realign your life with your values. So. Please, uh, Megan, I, I've, I've talked too much. So let me, uh, let me hear the questions. Oh, it was wonderful. And we're getting a lot of feedback that um, folks are saying that it was super helpful. Uh, I particularly so love um, the, uh, you know, the short-term strategies and the long-term strategies. <laughs> I think the belly breathing and all of those sorts of things can be very helpful. But something that really stuck out to me was your tip about 
having 20 um, concrete minutes of worry time. I think that that's so helpful because it's so easy to get trapped in those kind of repeating patterns of like, what's going to happen? You know, what's going to happen about my job? What's going to happen? When am I going to be able to go outside? What's going to happen at the grocery store? And, and really kind of keeping that to a 20 Absolutely. minute. 20 minutes and it's there and, and, and you know, again, and it, you know, it, it will come up during other times. We have to be aware of it's going to come up, but if you have your phone and we always have our phones these days, right? Uh, uh, you, you just write it down. Okay. So this is a topic I need to put it for my 20 minutes or, you know, in the olden days, it used to be a worry chest. And you would put all, you know, on a little piece of paper, your worry and put it in a chest and then you open it for 20 minutes. <laughs> but of course, that's, you know, that's a technique from a couple of decades ago, right? <laughs> we just modernized it. Yes, exactly. All right. Well, let's turn to some questions from some of our guests. And we are actually getting a few on this one. Mm -hmm. um, folks are saying, you know, I have good days and bad days. And then I have days that are, are really tough where I'm not getting any sleep. So do you have yes. any tips on how to fall asleep and how to get a good night's sleep? Absolutely. So what we know is that both anxiety and sadness or depression, unfortunately, affects sleep pretty profoundly and vice versa. So, you know, they're kind of intricately connected. Uh, and that's one of the first things to go. So first of all, I want to validate that that's, you know, very, very common experience. What can you do about it? You know, first, um, something that we call, we call it sleep hygiene. So even though normally you might be a good sleeper and you don't have to worry about these, you know, specific sleep rules, this is a time when sleep goes to actually kind of reenact those. And those, you know, a couple of them. Um, tw tw two hours, recommendations actually from neuroscientists, two hours before sleep, no screens. I know that's not realistic for most of us. So my recommendation <laughs> usually is one hour. One hour, it can, if you can help it, one hour without screens. Do not sleep with your cell phone in your bedroom. That's another huge one. Do not charge your cell phone. Get, if you need to wake up in the morning, get one of those old fashioned, you know, Ikea sells them for $2, uh, you know, alarm clocks. Put your phone in a different room to charge. Uh, it's been shown for so many different reasons to be unhelpful for sleep. Um, in the middle of the night, oh, then another thing, you know, sleep, try to really keep bedroom for sleeping and sex and nothing else. Um, if you, if reading relaxes you, then have a little light read, uh, not from electronic sources, a uh, little bit at night and go to sleep, keep the room cool and cold. Um, you know, when you think evolutionary, when, you know, our ancestors, when they were going to sleep as the day was winding down, it was getting darker and it was getting cooler. Try to mimic that two hours before sleeping. If you get, take hot shower. And then after that, if you make your ambient your context cooler and um and less dimmer dimmer and cooler over the next two hours that really tends to promote sleep really good good thing the, the people talk about light often but not about the temperature and that's a very helpful one um it goes without saying that no caffeine in the afternoon um drinks while it, they help you fall asleep alcohol can help you fall asleep you will wake up in the middle of the night. It is, it's metabolism of alcohol is such that it, it promotes falling asleep, but it actually messes up your sleep. So really lay low on alcohol, basically. Um, and another thing is maybe the biggest one, if you wake up in the middle of the night and start spinning in worries and all of this, do not stay in bed past about 15 minutes trying to fall asleep. There is nothing worse for sleep than trying to fall asleep. If you try to fall asleep really, really hard, that will certainly make you not fall asleep. It's, 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 the, it's the typical paradoxical thing in psychology, right? So past 15 minutes, if it's 15 minutes, a lot of us, you know, will be awake 10, 15 minutes and fall back asleep. But if it's longer and you're finding yourself like, okay, I have to sleep. Oh my God, I, if I don't, I won't get enough sleep and, and then I'll be tired. No, get up, get <laughs> up of the bed, get out of the bed, go either, you know, I, if you have another room, go to another room, the idea is same things, no screens, low light, non-caffeinated beverage, milk or tea, um, do something, do puzzles, do yeah. crossword puzzles, do Sudoku, read, you know, books, read, uh, uh, do uh, coloring books, you know, anything that engages your mind, write, write poetry, find, you know, the best you can reframe this time as a gift. Oh, I have a little time that, you know, I've been wanting to write this poetry for what, 30 years? And I have this, you know, wee hour in the middle of an eye. 
and I'm going to do that because I'm, I'm not going to be sleeping anyway. I might yeah. as well sit here and try to do that and do that, focus on that. And then when next wave of sleepiness comes, because sleepiness comes in waves, when it comes, the next wave comes, then you need to catch the wave and then you go back to bed. Yeah. So that's, that's a really good one. I actually wrote uh, an article, uh, it was, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago in Washington Post. I, I pretty regularly write for Washington Post and I wrote an article about, um, you know, how anxiety is related to uh, difficulty concentrating, even difficulty with short-term memory and sleep and so forth. And I give some tips. So that's another, if you Google me and, and uh, Washington Post, you'll see some of that. Awesome. We love it. Yeah, the alcohol one is a good point because I think probably more than a few of us have been enjoying more than normal yep. glasses of wine, yes. you know, so yes. it's, it's yes. a good tip to remember. Um, okay, one more, another question. Um, one of our participants asks, I'm feeling a lot of numbness emotionally and I feel that I have to actually force myself to let it out, to cry or get upset. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on the numbness as a form of coping and how to work through that? So uh, that's, again, a very typical one. A lot of people will tell you, especially now, while we're in this suspended state, we, again, we don't know what are we adjusting to because it's mostly uncertain. Um, a lot of people are reacting. Like we've been hearing a lot of that um, th with numbness. And numbness, actually, a lot, uh, not many people know this. Numbness can actually also be, um, if it persists, if it's really persisting over many weeks and you really are unable to feel you know, anything good or bad, it can mm -hmm. be a sign of clinical depression. So while, you know, when we think about clinical depression, we think about inability to enjoy things and sadness, numbness and inability, and we call it anhedonia, inability to really emotionally react, enjoy anything, that can be actually a sign of clinical depression if, if it persists. Or in the shorter term, if you're finding yourself from time to time like that, or it's, you know, lasting maybe a day, then it's gone, then it comes back and so forth, I would say that's quite normal. And for that, really bring self-compassion. I wouldn't, you know, this idea of forcing yourself to cry, don't force yourself to cry. Don't just, you know, accept that as also a normal emotional response to, to this. And, you know, and, you know, ask yourself, can I be numb and go for a walk for an hour? Yeah, I can. You know, I might not enjoy it as, as I would like to enjoy it or as it's familiar for me, you know, to enjoy, but I can still walk. I can still keep that kind of healthy routine and, and be numb. And it turns out that that will then help you next day to feel ne less numb and so forth. So, so being really self-compassionate about your emotional experience, including numbness, and making sure that you are implementing those behaviors that we know will help. Definitely makes sense. All right, I want to leave um, it on this question because I love it sure. and I think it's, it's really, really positive. Um, and one of our guests asked, um, one positive thing that seems to have come out of this is that mental health is being spotlighted now more than ever. We're all experiencing this coping stage of COVID, but how are mental health professionals preparing for and anticipating the next stage of processing global trauma post COVID? Uh, we are in it with all of you guys. <laughs> I, you know, I, I wish I could say we have a sort of miracle solution, but we don't, you know, we are, you, you are absolutely right that this is spotlighting mental health uh, in a more significant way than I've seen in many years. And what I really am hoping for, it's also destigmatizing, destigmatizing, you know, psychological uh, distress and also destigmatizing looking for help. Again, I'll, I'll, I'll quote one of my, art, that's my last article in the post that just came out last week, where an uh, editor uh, asked me, usually I pitch to them, you know, I, I, I am not a professional uh, a journalist, so when I want to write about something, I pitch to them. This time they came to me, and, and it, for this very reason, uh, editor said, you know, you know, we're hearing about that a lot of people are you know, considering getting some help around uh, these, you know, difficult psychological experiences for the first time in their life. You know, they're just, they, they're really unfamiliar with the, with the landscape of mental health and, you know, the therapists and who are the psychiatrists versus psychologists versus social workers. What do you all guys do and kind of stuff, right? And so she asked me to write basically a primer. I would say a, like a primer of, you know, what, what is therapy? What can therapy do for you? When should you think about, you know, getting therapy? You know, what can medications for, do and so forth? And so, so, you know, I thought, oh my God, this is, you know, I, I really saw it as, a, and she said, it's like a public 
you know, public man, uh, a public health message, right? To to uh, to bring about this openness and have us all converse about this, which you know we should be doing anyway. But you know, thanks to COVID, we are doing more of that. And I so what I really really hope that is going to come out of this is uh, you know more awareness, less stigma. Uh, hopefully, hopefully we can always hope. Uh, revised mental health and insurance systems so that more people have access to good mental health care because that is a big problem. Um, and so, you know, uh, uh, we we are working. We are working toward this and doing webinars like this is my little part of, of doing this as well as writing these articles. Wonderful. Well, I think that's a great note to end on. I, I definitely share those hopes as well. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really, really, really Appreciate your insight and your expertise. And um, thanks to everybody who joined from the Blue Ground community. Any questions who, um, that we didn't get to, we'll be sure to answer and send some uh, responses as well as some um, tips to take home with you from Dr. K as well. Um, so thank you so much and everybody have a great evening. Thank you so much for having me and stay safe. Bye-bye.